Chapter 20 Shouldn't she be back, Giza? Kreb asked. He had been anxiously pacing in and out of the cave all afternoon. Isa nodded nervously, not looking up from the cold-cooked venison haunch she was cutting into chunks. Ow! she cried suddenly, as the sharp blade she was using opened a gash in her finger. Kreb looked up, surprised as much by the fact that she cut herself as by her spontaneous outburst. Isa was so skilled with the stone knife he couldn't remember the last time she did it. Poor Isa, Kreb thought. I've been so worried myself, I forgot how she must feel, he berated himself. No wonder she's nervous. She's worried too. I talked to Brun a while ago, Isa, Kreb motioned. He's reluctant to look for her yet. No one should know where a woman disposes... where she is at a time like this. You know how unlucky it would be for a man to see her. But she's so weak. She could be out there lying in the rain someplace. You could go look for her, Isa. You're a medicine woman. She can't have gone too far. Don't worry about cooking. I can wait. Why don't you go ahead? It'll be dark soon. I can't, Isa gestured and put her cut finger back into her mouth. What do you mean you can't? Kreb was puzzled. I can't find her. How do you know you can't find her if you don't look? The old magician was thoroughly confused. Why doesn't Isa want to look for her? Come to think of it, why hasn't she been out looking long before this? I would have thought she'd be scouring the woods, turning over stones to find Ayla by now. She's so nervous. Something is wrong. Isa, why don't you want to look for Ayla? He asked. It wouldn't help. I couldn't find her. Why? He pressed. The woman's eyes were filled with fearful anxiety. She's hiding, Isa confessed. Hiding? What is she hiding from? Everyone. Brun, you, me, the whole clan, she replied. Kreb was completely at a loss, and Isa's enigmatic answers only made it worse. Isa, you'd better explain. Why is Ayla hiding from the clan, or me, or you? Especially you. She needs you now. She wants to keep the baby, Kreb, Isa gestured then rushed on, begging him with her eyes to understand. I told her it was the mother's duty to dispose of a deformed baby, but she refused. You know how much she wanted it. She said she was going to take him and hide him until his naming day so Brun would have to accept him. Kreb stared hard at the woman, quickly grasping the full implications of Ayla's willfulness. Yes... Brun will be forced to accept her son, Isa, and then he'll curse her for deliberate disobedience, this time forever. Don't you know if a woman forces a man against his will, he loses face? Brun can't afford that. The men wouldn't respect him anymore. Even if he curses her, he'll lose face, and the clan gathering is this summer. Do you think he can face the other clans now? The whole clan will lose face because of Ayla, the magician gestured angrily. Whatever made her think of such a thing? It was one of Abba's stories, about the mother who put her deformed baby up in a tree, Isa answered. The distraught woman was beside herself. Why hadn't she thought about it more? Old women's tales, Kreb motioned with disgust. Abba should know better than to fill a young woman's head with such nonsense. It wasn't only Abba, Kreb. It was you, too. Me? When did I ever tell her such stories? You didn't have to tell her any stories. You were born deformed, but you were allowed to live. Now you're Mogur. Isa's statement jolted the lopsided, one-armed magician. He knew the series of fortuitous events that led to his acceptance. 
Only luck had preserved the highest holy man of the clan. His mother's mother once told him it was nothing short of a miracle. Was Ayla trying to make a miracle happen for her son because of him? It would never work. She'd never force Brun into accepting her son and live. It had to be his wish, his decision, entirely his. And you, Weeza, didn't you tell her it was wrong? I begged her not to go. I told her I'd get rid of the baby if she couldn't, but she wouldn't let me near him after that. Oh, Kreb, she suffered so much to have him. So you let her go, hoping her plan would work. Why didn't you tell me or Brun? Isa just shook her head. Kreb is right. I should have told him. Now Ayla will die too, not just her baby, she thought. Where did she go, Isa? Kreb's eye had turned to stone. I don't know. She said something about a small cave, the woman replied with sinking heart. The magician turned abruptly and limped to the hearth of the leader. The baby's cries finally woke Ayla from her exhausted sleep. It was dark and the little cave was damp and chilly without a fire. She went to the back to relieve herself and winced as the warm, ammoniacal fluid stung her raw, torn flesh. She fumbled in the dark through her collecting basket for a clean strap and a fresh wrap for the wet and soiled infant, drank some water, then, wrapping her fur around them, she lay back down to nurse her son. The next time she woke up, the wall of the cave was dappled with sunlight streaming through the tangled hazelnut branches that hid the entrance. She ate her food cold while the baby suckled. The food and rest revived her, and she sat up holding her baby, musing dreamily. I'll need to get some wood, she thought, and my food won't last too long. I should get some more. Alfalfa should be sprouting. It'll strengthen my blood, too. New clover and vet shoots must be ready, and bulbs. The sap is up. The inner bark will be sweet now, especially maple. No, maple doesn't grow this high, but there's birch and fir. Let's see, new burdock and colt's foot and young dandelion leaves and fern. Most of it will still be curled. I remembered my sling. There's lots of ground squirrels around here, and beaver, and rabbits. Ayla daydreamed about the pleasures of the warming season. But when she stood up, she felt a gush of blood and a wave of dizziness. Her legs were caked with dried blood that stained her foot coverings and her wraps jolting her into a more realistic awareness of her desperate situation. When the dizziness passed, she decided to clean herself and then get some wood. But she didn't know what to do with the baby. She was torn between taking him with her or letting him sleep where he was. Women of the clan never left babies untended. They were always within sight of some woman, and Ayla hated the thought of leaving him alone. But she had to clean herself and get more water and she could carry more wood without him. She peeked out through the bare-limbed bushes to make sure no one was near, then pushed the branches aside and left the cave. The ground was soggy. Near the creek, it was a slippery mire of mud. Patches of snow still lingered in shaded nooks. Shivering in the brisk wind that blew from the east, pushing more rain clouds before it, Ayla stripped and stepped into the cold creek to rinse herself, then sponged her wraps. The clammy, damp leather did little to warm her when she put them back on. She walked to the woods that surrounded the high pasture and tugged at some of the lower dried branches of a fir tree. A whirling vertigo overwhelmed her, her knees buckled, and she reached for a tree to steady herself. Her head was pounding. She swallowed hard to keep from retching as her weakness engulfed her. All thoughts of hunting or gathering food left her. The depleting pregnancy, the ravaging delivery, and the grueling cl climb all had taken their toll. She had little strength left. The baby was crying when she got back to the cave. It was cool and damp, and he missed her warm closeness. She picked him up and held him, 
then remembered the water bag she had left by the creek. She had to have water. She put her son down and dragged herself out of the cave again. It was starting to rain. When she returned, she sunk down, exhausted, and pulled the damp, heavy fur over them. She was too tired to notice the sharp edges of fear nicking away at the corners of her mind as sleep overwhelmed her. Didn't I tell you she was insolent and willful? Brow gestured self-righteously. Did anyone believe me? No. They took her side. Made excuses. Let her have her way. Even let her hunt. I don't care how strong her totem is. Women are not supposed to hunt. The cave lion didn't lead her to it. It was just defiance. See what happens when you give a woman too much freedom? See what happens when you're too lenient? Now she thinks she can force her deformed son into the clan. No one can make excuses for her this time. She deliberately disobeyed the customs of the clan. It's inexcusable. At last, Browd had been vindicated, and he gloried in his chance to say, I told you so. He rubbed it in with a vengeance that made the leader wince. Brun didn't like losing face, and the son of his mate didn't make it any easier. You've made your point, Browd, he signaled. There's no need to keep on about it. I'll take care of her when she comes back. No woman has ever forced me to do anything against my will and gotten away with it, and no woman will start now. When we search again tomorrow morning, Brun said, going on to the reason he called the meeting, I think we should look at places we seldom go. Isa said Ayla knew of a small cave. Has anyone ever seen a small cave nearby? It can't be too far. She was too weak to get very far. Let's forget about the steppes or the forest and search where caves are likely to be. With this rain, her trail has been washed away, but there might be a footprint left. Whatever it takes, I want her found. Isa waited anxiously for Brun's meeting to end. She had been trying to work up courage to speak to him and decided the time was now. When she saw the men leave, she walked to his hearth with bowed head and sat at his feet. "'What do you want, Isa? Brun asked after tapping her shoulder. "'This unworthy woman would speak to the leader,' Isa began. "'You may speak. This woman was wrong not to come to the leader when she learned what the young woman planned to do. Isa forgot to use the formal form of address as her emotions overcame her. But Brun, she wanted a baby so much. No one thought she would ever conceive life, least of all her. How could the spirit of the cave lion be overcome? She was so happy about it. Even though she suffered, she never complained. She almost died giving birth, Brun. Only the thought that her baby would die gave her strength at the end. She just couldn't bear to give him up, even if he was deformed. She was sure it was the only baby she would ever have. She was out of her head from the shock and the pain. She wasn't thinking straight. I know I have no right to ask, Brun, but I beg you to let her live. Why didn't you come to me before, Isa? If you thought begging for her life would do any good now, why didn't you come to me then? Have I been so unkind to her? I was not blind to her suffering. A man can avert his eyes or to avoid looking into another man's hearth, but he cannot close his ears. There's not a person in this clan who does not know the pain Ayla suffered to give birth to her son. Do you think me so hard-hearted, Isa? If you had come to me, told me how she felt, what she planned to do, don't you think I would have considered allowing her baby to live? I could have overlooked her threat to run and hide as the ravings of a woman out of her head. I would have examined the child. Even without a mate, if the deformity is not too gross, I might have allowed it. But you gave me no opportunity. You assumed to know what I would do. That's not like you, Isa. 
I have never known you to be derelict in your duty. You have always been an example for the other women. I can only blame your behavior on your illness. I know how sick you are, though you try to hide it. I respected your wishes and made no mention of it. But I was sure you were ready to walk in the world of the spirits last autumn. I was well aware Ayla believed this was her one chance to have a child. I suspect she is right. Yet I saw her put all thoughts of herself aside when you were ill, Isa, and she pulled you through. I don't know how she did it. Maybe it was Mogur who placated the spirits that wanted you to join them and convinced them to allow you to stay. But it wasn't Mogur alone. I was ready to grant his request and allow her to become medicine woman. I had come to respect her as much as I once respected you. She's been an admirable woman, a model of dutiful obedience in spite of the son of my mate. Yes, Isa, I am aware of Broud's harsh treatment of her. Even her one lapse early last summer was provoked by him in some way, though I don't fully understand how. It is unworthy of him to pit himself against a woman the way he does. Broud is a very brave and strong hunter and has no reason to feel his manhood is threatened by any female. But perhaps he did see something I overlooked. Perhaps he's right. I have been blind to her. Isa, if you had come to me before... I might have considered your request. I might have let her son live. It is too late now. When she returns on her child's naming day, both Ayla and her son will die. The next day, Ayla tried to make a fire. There were still a few sticks of dry wood left from her previous stay. She twirled the stick between her palms against another piece of wood, but she didn't have the endurance to maintain the sustained effort required to make it smolder. And it was fortunate for her that she couldn't. Droog and Krug found their way to the mountain meadow while she and the baby slept. They would have smelled a fire or the remains of one and found her. As it was, they walked so close to the cave that if the baby had whimpered in his sleep, they would have heard but the entrance to the small hole in the rock wall was so well hidden by the thick old strand of hazelnut bushes, they didn't notice it. But fortune smiled on her even more. The spring rains dripping sullenly from a leaden sky, turning the bank of the small creek into a sink of mud, and the ground of the meadow into a sodden marsh, and casting a pall over her spirits, washed away all traces of her. So expert were the hunters at tracking, they could identify the individual footprints of each member of the clan, and their sharp eyes would easily have seen broken off shoots or disturbed earth from dug up bulbs or roots if she had gathered any food. Her very weakness saved her from discovery. When Ayla went out later and saw the men's footprints in the mud near the spring that gave rise to the creek, where they had stopped for a drink of water, her heart nearly stopped. It made her afraid to go outside. She started at every gust that shook the brush fronting her cave and strained to hear imagined sounds. The food she had brought with her was nearly gone. She searched through the baskets she had made to store food during the long, lonely stay of her temporary death curse. All she found were some dried nuts, rotten, and the droppings of small rodents evidence that her store had been found and long since eaten. She found the rotten, dried remains of the surplus of food Isa had given her when she used the cave as shelter during her woman's curse, totally inedible. Then she remembered the cache of dried deer meat in the stone pit at the back of the cave from the deer she killed for a warm wrap. Ayla found the small mound of rocks and moved them. The preserved meat in the cache was undisturbed, but the easing of her tensions was short-lived. The branches at the mouth of the cave moved, and Ayla's heart raced. Uba, she gestured with shocked surprise as the girl entered the cave. How did you find me? 
I followed you the day you left. I was so afraid something would happen to you. I brought you some food and some tea to make your milk flow. Mother made it. Does Isa know where I am? No. She knows I do, though. I don't think she wants to know or she'll have to tell Brun. Oh, Ayla, Brun is so mad at you. The men have been searching for you every day. I saw their footprints by the spring, but they didn't see the cave. Broud is bragging about how he knew all along how bad you were. I've hardly seen Kreb at all since you left. He spends all day in the place of the spirits, and Mother is so upset. She wants me to tell you not to come back. Oba said, her eyes wide with fear for the young woman. If she hasn't talked to you about me, how could Isa give you a message for me? Ayla asked. She cooked extra last night and this morning, too. Not too much. I think she was afraid Kreb would guess it was for you. But she didn't eat her share. Later, she made the tea. Then she started moaning and talking to herself like she was grieving for you. She's been grieving for you ever since you left, but she was looking right at me. She kept saying, if only someone could tell Ayla not to come back. My poor child, my poor daughter, she has no food, she's weak. She needs to make milk for her baby, and things like that. Then she left the hearth. This water bag was right next to the tea, and the food was all wrapped. She must have seen me go when I followed you. Uba continued. I wondered why she didn't scold me for being gone so long. Brun and Kreb are both mad at her for not telling that you were going to hide. If they knew she had some idea how to find you and didn't tell them, I don't know what they'd do to her. But no one has asked me. No one pays much attention to children anyway, especially girls. Ayla, I know I should tell Kreb where you are, but I don't want Brun to curse you. I don't want you to die. Ayla could feel her heart beating in her ears. What have I done? She hadn't realized the extent of her weakness or how difficult it would be to survive alone with a small baby when she threatened to leave the clan. She had counted on going back on her baby's naming day. What am I going to do now? She picked up her baby and held him close. But I couldn't let you die, could I? Uba looked sympathetically at the young mother, who seemed to have forgotten she was there. Ayla, she said tentatively, could I see him? I never did get a chance to see your baby. Oh, Uba, of course you can see him, she motioned, feeling bad that she had been ignoring the girl after she came all the way to bring Isa's message. She could get in trouble for it, too. If it was ever found out that Uba knew how to find Ayla and didn't tell, her punishment would be severe. It could ruin her life. Would you like to hold him? Could I? Ayla put the baby in her lap. Uba started to move aside his swaddling, then looked up at Ayla for permission. The mother nodded. He doesn't look so bad, Ayla. He's not crippled like Kreb. He's kind of skinny, but it's mostly his head that looks different. Not as different as you, though. You don't look like anyone else in the clan. That's because I wasn't born to the clan. Isa found me when I was a little girl. She says I was born to the others. I'm clan now, though, Ayla said proudly. Then her face dropped. But not for long. Do you ever miss your mother? I mean, your real mother, not Isa? The girl asked. I don't remember any mother except Isa. I don't remember anything before I came to live with the clan. She suddenly blanched. Uba, where will I go if I can't go back? Who will I live with? I'll never see Isa or Kreb either. This is the last time I'll ever see you. But I didn't know what else to do. I couldn't let my baby die. I don't know, Ayla. Mother says Brun will lose face if you make him accept your son. That's why he's so mad. She says if a woman makes a man do something, the other men won't respect him anymore. Even if he curses you afterward, he'll lose face just because you forced him to do something against his will. I don't want you to go away, Ayla, but you'll die if you come back. 
The young woman looked at the stricken face of the girl, not realizing her own tear-streaked face held a similar expression. They both reached out to each other simultaneously. You'd better go, Uba, before you get in trouble, Ayla said. The girl gave the baby back to his mother and got up to leave. Uba, Ayla called as the girl started to move the branches aside. I'm glad you came to see me, just so I could talk to you once more. And tell Isa, tell my mother I love her. Tears were flowing again. Tell Kreb, too. I will, Ayla. The girl lingered for a moment longer. I am going now, she said, and quickly left the cave. After Uba left, Ayla unwrapped the package of food she had brought. There wasn't much, but with the dried venison it would last a few days. But what then? She couldn't think. Her mind whirled in a maelstrom of confusion, sucking her into a black hole of utter despair. Her plan had backfired. Not only her baby's life, but her own was in jeopardy. She ate without tasting and drank some tea, then lay down with her infant again and slipped into the oblivion of sleep. Her body had its own needs. It demanded rest. It was night when she woke again and drank the last of the cold tea. She decided to get more water while it was dark and there was no chance of being seen by searching men. She fumbled in the dark for the water bag and in a moment of panic lost her sense of direction in the stark blackness of the cave. The branches camouflaging the entrance, outlined eerily by a darkness not quite as black, reoriented her and she quickly scrambled out. A crescent moon, playing tag with racing clouds, shed little light, but her eyes, fully dilated by the black inside the cave, could see ghostly trees vaguely silhouetted in the dim glow. The whispering water of the spring, splashing over rocks in a miniature waterfall, reflected the shining silver with a faint iridescence. Ayla was still weak, but she didn't get dizzy when she stood up anymore, and walking was easier. No men of the clan saw her as she bent near the spring under the concealing cover of darkness, but she was watched by other eyes more used to seeing by moonlight. Nocturnal prowlers and their night-feeding prey both drank from the same source as she. Ayla had never been so vulnerable since she wandered alone as a naked five-year-old child. Not so much because of her weakness, but because she wasn't thinking in terms of survival. She wasn't on guard. Her thoughts were turned inward. She would have been easy prey to any lurking predator drawn by the rich smells. But Ayla had made her presence felt before. Swift stones, not always lethal, but painful, had left their mark. Carnivores whose territory included the cave tended to shy away from it. It gave her an edge, a safety factor a reserve of security from which she drew heavily now. There has to be some sign of her, Brun gestured angrily. If she took food, it can't last forever. She's got to come out of hiding soon. I want every place that's been searched, searched again. If she's dead, I want to know it. Some scavenger would find her and there would be evidence of it. I want her found before the naming day. I will go to no clan gathering unless she's found. Now she's going to keep us from going to the clan gathering, Browd sneered. Why was she ever accepted into the clan in the first place? She's not even clan. If I were leader, I would never have accepted her. If I were leader, I wouldn't have let Isa keep her. I wouldn't even have let Isa pick her up. Why couldn't anyone else see her for what she is? This is not the first time she's been disobedient, you know. She has always flaunted the ways of the clan and gotten away with it. Did anyone stop her from bringing animals into the cave? Did anyone stop her from going off alone like no good clan woman would think of doing? No wonder she spied on us when we were practicing. And what happened when she got caught using a sling? A temporary death curse. And when she got back, she was allowed to hunt. 
Imagine a woman of the clan hunting. Do you know what the other clans would think of that? It's not surprising we're not going to the clan gathering. Is it any wonder she'd think she could force her son on us? Browd, we've all heard that before. Brun motioned wearily. Her disobedience will not go unpunished, I promise you. Browd's constant harping on the same theme was not only wearing on Brun's nerves, it was making an impression. The leader was beginning to question his own judgment, judgment that had to be based on adherence to long-standing traditions and customs that allowed little room for deviation. Yet, as Browd kept reminding him, Ayla had gotten away with a gradually worsening list of transgressions that did seem to lead to this unforgivable, deliberate act of defiance. He had been too generous with the outsider not born with an inherent sense of clan rightness, too lenient with her. She took advantage of him. Browd was right. He should have been more strict. He should have made her conform. Perhaps he never should have allowed the medicine woman to pick her up. But did the son of his mate have to keep on about it? Browd's constant nagging made an impression on the rest of the hunters, too. Most were all but convinced Ayla had somehow blinded them with a smokescreen of deception, and only Browd had seen her with clear eyes. When Brun was not around, the young man cast aspersions on the leader, hinting that he was too old to lead them effectively any longer. Brun's loss of face was a devastating blow to his confidence. He could sense the men's respect slipping away, and he could not bear to face a gathering of the clans under such circumstances. Ayla stayed in the cave, leaving only for water. Bundled in furs, she was warm enough even without a fire. The food Uba brought in the forgotten store of deer meat, dry as leather and tough to chew but highly concentrated nourishment, seasoned by hunger, made gathering or hunting unnecessary. It gave her time for the rest she needed. No longer drained by the demands of nurturing a not-quite-right fetus, her healthy young body, toughened by the years of strenuous physical exercise, was recuperating. She didn't need to sleep as much, but in some ways that was worse. Her troubled thoughts weighed on her constantly, at least when she was sleeping, she was free of anxiety. Ayla was sitting near the mouth of the cave holding her sleeping son in her arms. White, watery fluid dribbling out of the corner of his mouth and dripping from the other breast stimulated by his nursing gave evidence that her milk had started to flow. The afternoon sun, hidden occasionally by fast-moving clouds, warmed the spot near the entrance with its dappled light. She was looking at her son, watching his regular breathing interrupted by twitching eye movements and little jerky spasms that started him making sucking motions with his mouth before relaxing again. She looked at him more closely, turning his head to see his profile. Oba said you don't look so bad, Ayla thought. I don't think you do either. Just a little different. That's what Oba said, too. You just look different but not as different as me. Ayla suddenly remembered the reflection of herself she had seen in the still pool. Not as different as me. Ayla examined her son again, trying to remember the reflection of herself. My forehead bulges out like that, she thought, reaching up to touch her face. And that bone under his mouth, I've got one too. But he's got brow ridges and I haven't. Clan people have brow ridges. If I'm different, why shouldn't my baby be different? He should look like me, shouldn't he? He does, a little, but he looks a little like clan babies, too. He looks like both. I wasn't born to the clan, but my baby was. Only he looks like me and them, like both mixed together. I don't think you're deformed at all, my son. If you were born to me and born to the clan, you should look like both. If the spirits were mixed together, shouldn't you look mixed together too? That's the way you look. The way you should look. But whose totem started you? No matter whose it was, it must have had help. 
None of the men have a stronger totem than I have, except Kreb. Did the cave bear start you, my baby? I live at Kreb's hearth. No, it couldn't be. Kreb says Ursus never allows his spirit to be swallowed by a woman. Ursus always chooses. Well, if it wasn't Kreb, who else have I been close to? Ayla got a sudden image of Browd hovering close to her. No. She shook her head, rejecting the thought. Not Browd. He didn't start my baby. She shuddered with revulsion, thinking of the future leader and the way he had forced her to submit to his desires. I hate him. I hated it every time he came close to me. I'm so glad he doesn't bother me anymore. I hope he never, never wants to relieve his needs with me again. How does Oga stand it? How does any woman stand it? Why do men have needs like that? Why should a man want to put his organ in the place babies come from? That place should be just for babies, not for men's organs to make all sticky. Men's organs don't have anything to do with babies, she thought indignantly. The incongruity of the meaningless act stayed in her mind. Then a strange thought insinuated itself. Or do they? Could a man's organ have something to do with babies? Only women can have babies, but they have both girl and boy babies, she mused. I wonder, when a man puts his organ in the place babies come from, could he be getting it started? What if it's not the spirit of a man's totem? What if it's a man's organ that starts a baby? Wouldn't that mean the baby belongs to him too? Maybe that's why men have that need, because they want to start a baby. Maybe that's why women like it, too. I've never seen a woman swallow a spirit, but I've seen men put their organs in women often. No one ever thought I'd have a baby. My totem is too strong. But I did anyway, and it started just about the time Browd was relieving his needs with me. No, it's not true. That would mean my baby is Browd's baby, too. Ayla thought with horror. Kreb is right. He's always right. I swallowed a spirit that fought with my totem and defeated him. Maybe more than one. Maybe all of them. She clutched her baby fiercely as though trying to keep him to herself. You're my baby, not Brout's. It wasn't even the spirit of Brout's totem. The infant was startled by the sudden movement and began to cry. She rocked him gently until he quieted. Maybe my totem knew how much I wanted to have a baby and let himself be defeated. But why would my totem let me have a baby when he knew it would have to die? A baby that is part me and part clan is always going to look different. They'll always say my babies are deformed. Even if I had a mate, my babies wouldn't look right. I'll never be able to keep one. They'll all have to die. What difference does it make? I'm going to die anyway. We're both going to die, my son. Ayla held her baby close, rocking him and crooning while tears streamed down her face unnoticed. What am I going to do, my baby? What am I going to do? If I go back on your naming day, Brun will curse me. Isa said not to come back, but where can I go? I'm not strong enough to hunt yet. And even if I were, what would I do with you? I couldn't take you with me. I couldn't hunt with a baby. You might cry and warn the animals away. But I couldn't leave you alone. Maybe I wouldn't have to hunt. I can find food. But we need other things, too. Wraps and furs and cloaks and foot coverings. And where will I find a cave to live in? I can't stay here. There's too much snow in winter and it's too close. They'd find me sooner or later. I could go away, but I might not find a cave, and the men would track me and bring me back. Even if I did get away and found a cave and stored enough food to last through next winter, and even managed to hunt a little, we'd still be alone. You need more people than just me. Who would you play with? Who would teach you to hunt? And what if something happened to me? Who would take care of you then? You'd be all alone. 
just as I was before Isa found me. I don't want you to be alone. I don't want to be alone either. I want to go home. Ayla sobbed, burying her head in her infant swaddling. I want to see Uba again and Kreb. I want my mother. But I can't go home. Brun's mad at me. I made him lose face and he's going to curse me. I didn't know it would make him lose face. I just didn't want you to die. Brun's not so bad. He let me hunt. What if I didn't try to force him to accept you? What if I just begged him to let you live? If I went back now, he wouldn't lose face. There's still time. There are two fingers left before your naming day. Maybe then he wouldn't be so angry. What if he is? What if he says no? What if they take you away from me? I wouldn't want to live if they took you away now. If you have to die, I want to die too. If I go back and Brun says you have to die, I'll beg him to curse me. I'll die too. I won't let you go back to the world of the spirits alone, my baby. I promise if you have to go, I'll go with you. I'm going right now to beg Brun to let me keep you. What else can I do? Ayla began throwing things into her collecting basket. She wrapped the baby in the carrying cloak and both of them in her fur wrap and pushed aside the branches that hid the small cave. As she was crawling out, her eyes fell on something glittering in the sun. A sparkling gray rock lay at her feet. She picked it up. It wasn't just one rock, but three small nodules of iron pyrite stuck together. She turned it over in her hand and watched the fool's gold glitter. As often as she had gone in and out of the small cave over the years, she had never seen the unusual stone before. Ayla clutched it in her hand and closed her eyes. Can this be a sign? A sign from my totem? Great cave lion, she motioned. Did I make the right decision? Are you telling me I should go back now? Oh, cave lion, let this be a sign. Let this be a sign that you have found me worthy, that it was all another test. Let this be a sign that my baby will live. Her fingers shook as she untied the knots of the small leather bag she wore around her neck. She added the oddly shaped glittering stone to the red-stained oval of mammoth tusk, the fossil cast of a gastropod, and the lump of red ochre. Her heart pounding with fear and one desperate hope, Ayla started down to the cave of the clan.